Well, Rich, we're here to talk about Star Trek Discovery. Yes, that's true. And usually on the internet, when people talk about Star Trek shows, they abbreviate the shows with three letter words, TOS, TNG, VOY, <laughs> DS9, and now we have <laughs> STD. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Review. I'm Mike. And I am Rich. And this is a very special episode because one, our set is different. And two, we're talking about something that just came out. In fact, yesterday it came out, uh, Star Trek Discovery. Normally our review shows are about older movies, but today we're gonna talk about something new because Rich, you and I have been waiting a long time for a new Star Trek television series. When did Enterprise end? 05. 05, yeah, so it's been over a decade. Over a decade. We did have Star Trek since Enterprise, uh, the J.J. Abrams films. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you rolled your eyes. Well, it's a film. It's, 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 a, different, it's a different beast. Yeah. And Star Trek is a thing that belongs on TV. Even though the first two episodes of Star Trek Discovery were a J.J. Abrams film. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still, I'm still not convinced we're getting Star Trek on TV. Well, let's talk. <laughs> now, Rich, what were your initial reactions to Star Trek Discovery? Um, who is this for? I don't understand how this is supposed to appeal to me, a Star Trek fan. I think Star Trek, it's, it's, it's the vision of a of a brighter future, Mike. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a galaxy where humanity has gotten its shit together and we've solved all of our problems. There's no more hunger, there's no more hate, and we get along with the other races of the galaxy and we try to spread our diplomacy wherever we go. Let's see what's out there. Engage. And then I watched Discovery and I was all just, whoa! I'M GONNA STAB YOU IN THE FUCKING FACE! This isn't Star Trek. That's my overall opinion of Star Trek Discovery. The other thing I find weird is this is a, a pilot episode. And I'm usually, I'm, I'm lenient on pilot episodes because they're, they're typically bad. A pilot episode has to introduce all of the characters and introduce the scenario, and then usually from there things can get better. After watching the pilot for Star Trek Discovery, we need a new pilot. We have one character. We have uh, Michael, and in the next episode, she's gonna be on a new ship with a new captain in a wildly different scenario than where she was at in the pilot episodes. It's so weird. Yeah, it's, it's like a, a setting up a backstory uh, to the show. Right. Which, I mean, I didn't necessarily have a problem with, I, I thought it was different. Uh, I like that our main character basically started an intergalactic war in the first <laughs> hour of the, the television series. Um, so it leaves it open to uh, taking lots of different twists. But, but before we talk about the storyline, we need to talk about the show itself, the look, the feel. Yeah, oh, vi visually, it's, it's kind of gorgeous. It's very cinematic. That's that's something that's different. It's very, uh, it looks as good or better than a movie. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, um, particularly one shot stuck out to me. Um, it's when the, the, the Shenzhou, the, the ship that's commanded by Michelle Yeoh, gets yeah. rescued by the Europa, the, uh, and there's that, they, they're, they're drifting and about to crash into an asteroid, and then you get that, that beautiful uh, shot where <laughs> it goes up and you see that it's the tractor beam from the Europa and it's very cinematic. And all I thought about was um, the Naked Now in TNG when they... Um, but Star Trek is in effects alone. No. And I wanted to mention to you specifically, one of your biggest gripes in the Star Trek universe yeah. was that ships always meet on the same plane. <laughs> Yes. And there is a shot in this show where they decloak and then the Shenzhou is like completely sideways. And I was like, Rich is gonna really appreciate that. I did that. appreciate that. Okay. I did appreciate, no, no, visually. Visually, I, I don't really have any issues. 
Oh, of course not. You can't have issues with the visuals and the special effects. Some people have, I, I've heard bitching online, like, this looks different than it did in the original. How does the, how does the original series evolve from this? And, 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 and here's the thing, I'm, I'm gonna say it, if you're a super hardcore Star Trek fan, you might not like this, but the original series doesn't look like the future anymore. You, you can't do that. You can't have the, the knobs that just won't work. I, the, the, it just, you, we have to deal with the fact that the future is now holographic displays. Well, well on that note, I, I really enjoyed this overall. Um, mainly when I did two things with my brain. One, I pretended that this was way far in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and I pretended that it was a uh, uh, Kelvin timeline. Yeah. With those two things in mind, and both of those are wrong in the show <laughs> context. I, with both of those things in mind, I sat that back and I said, hey, this is 150 years after Picard's dead. Look at that. They got, they got holographic communications with people that, walking around the room. Right, like, right. What the fuck? That's great. Look I... at that. Look at how far the Federation has advanced. I love it. Are you receiving my image, Captain? Yes, and you? You appear to be sitting on my bridge. It may take me a while to get used to this. I'm not fond of uninvited guests. The two-hour opening was great. I, I, I really liked it um, as, a, as a nice movie. You say, you say you like it as a movie. Do you like it as a Star Trek movie, though? Because that's, that's, the, that's the thing I'm struggling with. It's like, how is this Star Trek in any way? Just just thematically. This is like, like Battlestar Galactica. That's the big issue. I'm gonna say issue, I'm not gonna say problem. Yeah. It's an issue. It's, it's the phrase, you can never go home again. <laughs> uh, we are in 2017 and you cannot make Star Trek Voyager anymore. And, and I'm sitting there, I'm watching it and I'm thinking in the very first five minutes of the movie, they literally violate the prime directive. <laughs> So you have that opening scene, Captain Georgiou and Michael Burnham. The captain and the first officer of the Shenzhou are on an alien planet. They're walking around and their mission is to save this alien species because the planet is undergoing a, a hundred year drought, right? Yeah. And they're like, well, as long as they don't see us, we don't violate, you know, directive one, prime directive right. or whatever she says. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's true in the case of like, who watches the watchers? where you can go in and observe an alien culture, but not interfere. But if it's the natural course of, of uh, uh, an alien life form is to go extinct because of planetary conditions, you really shouldn't alter that. So we make an exception in the deaths of millions? Yes. And is it the same situation if it's an epidemic and not a geological calamity? Absolutely. What about a war? If generations of conflict is killing millions, do we interfere? The Prime Directive clearly states there can be no interference with the internal development of alien civilization. Oh, no, it says! Who knows, maybe since that time and TNG time, they have maybe become a little more hardcore right. about right. the Prime Directive. But at first I was like, oh. But it, as a scene it worked because you got the captain and the first officer and they're going on a little mission. They're two ladies. Uh, they're, they're, it's very symbolic that there, there's, um, there's eggs. Yeah. Because they're women. <laughs> um, it's, it was very motherly. They're, they're saving this race. Um, they're providing water. Um, it's, it was all very symbolic, and that's what I got out of it. Because the, the Klingons? Like visually, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't give a fuck about them being visually different. Like I said, you know, TOS, the forehead thing between TOS and TNG. You know, they, they've they've already visually changed the Klingons, but like TOS and Star Trek the motion picture. Yeah, yeah, but culturally, what, you know, something that just small that stuck out to me, much like the, the water prime directive thing, is uh, the corp ship. Mm. Do you remember what the, the Klingons' attitude towards corpses was in TNG? It was just a vessel. Yeah, I, 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 what, what TNG episode was it where it was like, I think it was one of the Worf ones where Worf killed... Uh... <laughs> 
Picard was like on the screen with the Klingons, like, what do, you, do you want? Do you want us to beam the body back? And the Klingons like, just shove it into space. We don't give a shit. Yeah, yeah. Do you wish the bodies returned? They are now only empty shells. Dispose of them as you see fit. Uh, this it's a tweak. People complaining about the look of the Klingons is, to me, a little silly. Um, did they have Klingons in the Abrams movies? They did for a they second, They did. Right? They look a little bit like this. Yeah, they were fucked yeah. up and weird looking, so. They don't have hair. Yeah. The strange, the strange thing about the changing look of the Klingons to me is, the old look is kind of iconic. It's a, it's a weird thing to change, because of what we had worked, but ah, uh, uh. I don't know, that's just details. Like, like you said, Klingons look like they smeared brown makeup on some guy <laughs> in the 1960s. And then when the movie came around, they're like, yeah, okay, let's put some things on their head. And then TNG comes around and then now it's this. Yeah. Eh, Klingons have never. Yeah, never they've, they've been changing all along, even, even culturally. Like in the original series, they're more just mustache twirling villains. You're right. We Klingons are not as luxury minded as you were this. Yes. And then later on, they kind of became the honor bound warrior race, so. Yeah, changing the Klingons is nothing new. I don't, I don't have an issue with things that are different. Do not show your face in this town again. Yeah, it's a whole different ball game. Um, I, I like the look of them uh, as like just this warrior alien race. We'll call yeah. them warrior alien race. Um, the costumes were very detailed. That set was great. Um, and I liked the fact that they had different, like, skin tones. Yeah. There's the albino one. Some of them were, like, purplish. And, you know, and that, that was always one thing that bugged me a little about old Star Trek um, is that the, the Federation had, like, all these different kinds of ships. Mm -hmm. But then, like, every other race had, like, such uniformity in their ships. Budget, uh, budget, Mike. Budget, yeah, a we, model. Uh, you, you have the Romulan Warbird, and, and there's, like, 12 of them, and they're all the same. And, like, no one at any point said, let's make a little different Romulan Warbird. Um, and Mark? all the all the races all kind of looked alike. Uh, you have you have the human race, and you have such a variety of, of how people look. But Klingons all look exactly the same, and Vulcans all look exactly the same. It's just like, eh. I like the fact that there is a weird albino Klingon. I thought that was different. And it made it a little more realistic. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the least interesting version of the Klingons, what we're looking at. They've monstrified them a little. Well, their motives are just, we need to unite and kill you. Yeah. Because we need to unite and kill you. Yeah, not a strong motivation there. Yeah. Hey, hey, all you leaders get together. You know what we really ought to do? We gotta kill that Federation. He lit the light. <laughs> All right, let's kill the Federation. You made a convincing argument, <laughs> sir. <laughs> yeah, I kind of liked when the Klingons had a little bit of, uh, they were more like, like drunken sailors. <laughs> well, they were individuals. Like they could be a drunken sailor or they could be like Worf where they were super uptight. You're right, yeah. They had this honor culture, but not all of them were all that honorable. They were they were individuals within that culture. Yeah, yeah. Light the light for Kaylee's. 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 Whatever. <laughs> I have the faith that we will all unite. I, I I think what it comes down to it, my major problem is, I hate the main character. Michael Burnham, I find that character intensely unlikable. The, and none of the other characters, except for the captain, uh, has much screen time. There's like weird face science dude, and he's a he's a non-character. I, I liked Saru. I, I thought uh, he was my favorite character, actually. Oh, the the science officer. Yeah, right. he, he had a little uh, C3PO vibe to him in the way that he spoke and acted, and he had he had some. He was the most like a human character. He had a little sass to him. He's not, he's, not, he's not the focus of the show. The focus of the show was clearly Michael Burnham. I understand they're going for like a redemption thing where, where she comes off as, as arrogant and, and reckless and, and stupid, but they need, they need to do something to make me want to root for her, to make me think she's redeemable, and I, I don't have it. The whole time I was watching, I'm like, ah, oh, you fuck up. You dumbass! The, the, the Klingon Empire is now unified, 
And like the only way they can stop this threat is to disgrace the, the new kind of leader. And the best way to do that with a Klingon is to capture him alive. That was their plan. That was their plan. Yeah. The captain and, and Michael beam aboard the Klingon ship. They're gonna kidnap this guy. And then in a fit of, uh, of rage, after she watches the, the Klingon leader they need to kidnap stab her captain, she switches her phaser from stun to kill and shoots him. Oh, she does. I, I wanna go back and re we, we should go back and rewatch this. I'm pretty sure you see the color change from blue to red. It's okay. deliberate. I didn't notice that. Yeah. I, thought, I thought, I know when they're running around shooting the guys, I, they were stunning them, I, yeah. I'm assuming. But yeah, I thought it was like an accident or if it was out of rage, then that's, that's interesting. I am pretty sure it was out of rage and I'm sure I'm supposed to think, oh, she was emotional. Instead, I'm thinking, what the fuck are you doing? Uh, I could definitely see what you're saying about not liking the main character. Uh, made a lot of terrible mistakes. Um, number one, starting an intergalactic war. Uh, number two, uh, uh, creating a martyr of, of a crazy Klingon who has unified an empire of a warrior race. Uh, against the Federation. Against the Federation, w yeah. Willfully. Possibly willfully, depending on the phaser we'll, setting. We'll go back and check the footage. I'm pretty sure you see the color change on the okay. phaser. Like, Fuck you! <laughs> Uh, I, I, yeah, that went by so fast I didn't notice. Hey, at least I got Klingon blood right. <laughs> that's that, that uh, uh, in, in re-watching Star Trek Enterprise, that's the very first thing they got wrong in the, the, the pilot. It's like, like that's red That's strange blood. for them to get wrong. It's right off the bat, wrong. Um, and that was, that was only really established in Star Trek VI. <laughs> And it was really only pink because if it was like crimson red, you wouldn't have seen it float around the spaceship as clearly. Well, I, I think also probably it would have hurt the rating. Oh, maybe too, yeah. This is the Star Trek movie, all this blood floating around yeah, in yeah. front of the camera. Ah, make it pink. Yeah, well, make it pink. <laughs> you, yeah, people will see it. People will see it better and uh, <laughs> the MPAA will like it. Rich, you mentioned a nitpick. Uh, what would that be? Yes, a nitpick. Um, we didn't talk about the plot much. The plot is there's a crazy Klingon holy man who wants to turn on the, the sacred light, which will glow like a star, and then it will unite the Klingon Empire, right? So they turn on this light. Like five minutes later, all of the heads of the Klingon houses all show up at the same time? Were they, were they sitting around waiting for this light to turn on? Maybe, maybe one of them could have been like on the toilet first. Yeah. Like I said, this is a nitpick. And I understand for the purposes of time and drama why they would do what they did. Well, that's 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 the word is drama. Is that this is this is drama heavy, and science Star Trek light. Mm -hmm. It's very dramatic and it's very like conflicty and everyone's running around and there's so much emotion going on and I mean it's like the opposite of Gene Roddenberry's vision of Star Trek, which is like a bunch of people who are on a spaceship and nobody fights with each other at all and we go around exploring. <laughs> Deep Space Nine, in a lot of ways, is kind of the anti-Star Trek. Oh, very much so. Very much so. Star Trek, humanity, peaceful, secular, we can do it, humanity can do it on our own. Deep Space Nine, it kind of like put a candle to those ideas. It, it tested them. It's like, well, war is kind of inevitable. What do you do now, Starfleet? Oh, gods, oh, there's this really religious race you gotta deal with. And it challenged the notions, but it did it in a smart way. Mm -hmm. That's what I like about Deep Space Nine, but it feels like I'm not, I'm not pointing a finger directly at Discovery. It's just like, like since then, all of Star Trek, from like the TNG movies on, it's just action. It's not, it's not, re-examining Starfleet's ideals in a smart way. It's just like, well, this show takes place in space. That means there was and people constantly shoot at each other. Well, it's it's that or it's it's a little of what, what a modern audience wants now. Uh, I was watching an interview with Rick Berman and Brandon Braga mm -hmm. on, when they're talking about Star Trek Enterprise and kind of why it failed. And basically they said, ever since Deep Space Nine and on, it had basically been diminishing returns. It was the burnout. That's, 
that's what went wrong with Star Trek in the first place. You had seven full fucking years of TNG, and TNG did its thing, and they, they kind of knew when to edit. Season seven was getting bad. Deep Space Nine was okay because, like I said, they were smart enough to, to you know, do something different with Trek. They, they, they looked at it in a different light, but then, and then, then Voyager came along, though, and it just, it, it tried to do TNG-style episodes, and then Enterprise came along, and Enterprise started to do TNG-style episodes, and then you had over a decade of the same thing, and it, it burnt out. Enterprise flopped spectacularly, <laughs> um, and it was like, okay, a prequel? Like, Star Trek prequel? Okay, a hundred years before Kirk and Spock. At, at that point, I'm like, like, it, it would have been so nice if everything just was chronological. Like, I'm okay with the Enterprise, uh, the original Enterprise from the 60s looking like garbage. <laughs> then it's like, things got better and better, and then we were going back to Enterprise, and Enterprise, it, the tech, the, the, the set was designed very well to look as low tech as it could and try and look like a ship that may have been built a hundred years before the original Enterprise. It's very metallic and, mm -hmm. you know, it was less comfortable, um, more like a submarine almost. Yeah. Um, Yet it still managed to look futuristic. Uh, yeah, 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 I mean, it looked nicer. The sets designs, the sets could be built better. Um, so that you, you almost, you can't build a set as bad as the original <laughs> Star Trek set. You just can't. But then, uh, then they all had, they had these blue jumpsuits with, with the color insignia on them. And then, and then it's like, eh. So then here comes Star Trek Discovery. And the idea is to make a prequel Star Trek series that takes place before TOS where everyone wears blue jumpsuits. Uh -huh. I'm like, why? We have been waiting for someone worthy of our attention. I'm trying to save you. I'm trying to save all of you. Uh, this this two, first two episodes worked really well as as a little movie. It felt like a, a J.J. Abrams Trek movie where instead of villain of the week, we have warrior race of the week. Yeah. And uh, and it was it was solidly done. It was uh, exciting. The f effects were great. Um, the acting was good, and everything around it was was enjoyable. But the problem with the Abrams movies is that they all kind of burned themselves out um, w with audiences. We're like Star Trek. Get Star Trek's back. Remember beam me up, Scotty. Remember <laughs> set phases to stun. I remember that. And then it's like. Duh, 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 duh. <laughs> And then, uh, and then number two comes around. Yeah, it's Condra! Yeah. And then number three, nobody saw. Even though it was one of the best, it was the best one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it ran its course and it burned itself out. To me, when, the reason why I love TNG so much is it's because of, it's a world that I would want to live in. Yes. It's it's this big flagship of the Federation. They, they go around, sure some bad stuff happens every <laughs> now and then, but really they're going around and they're doing their thing and it's a nice, big, comfortable ship and everybody gets along and every, I'm picturing myself living in the world of Star Trek Discovery and I don't really want to. No. Because it, it looks noisy, everyone's tilted and, and at any moment, and then ships explode. That is the most fantastic point I have ever heard in my entire life. That, that, that world fits you like a glove. It's like, ah, oh, this, this is bright and hopeful. There are things that are scary out there, like the Borg and uh, even Klingons. These Klingons, I'm gonna have nightmares from them because they're, they're like horrifying monsters, which is cool in a way. Are you saying that there is no place for that TNG-style hopefulness in this modern world? Is, is there no place for the diplomatic, uh, ethical problem where this, this faction wants this and this faction wants that, and Picard has to come in, uh, do the, the speech, but if we all get together, and da, 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 is there no room for that? Well, it's certainly not the Orville. It feels like fan fiction, the Orville. It feels like imitation TNG. It feel, yes, it's definitely a knockoff, but here's the thing. It has an audience, and I think it's because that audience wants that that bright, friendly 
Star Trek and not the I'm going to stab you in your fucking face Star Trek. It's it's more palatable if you if you ignore the fact that it has, it says Star Trek and if you just take this as it's as a new action based science fiction show. It works except the main character is a fucking jackass. I almost I almost think they should have started the show on the prison ship and we get to know her first as someone who has fallen from grace. Then we get the backstory later. I, I, I might have preferred that, but whatever. Uh, possibly. I mean, either way. Uh, I, I was wondering the whole time, is it because she's, she's got radiation in her brain that <laughs> she did all that? <laughs> the big thing to discuss is whether or not you can do the Star Trek that Rich Evans wants. Um, <laughs> and that a lot of fans want. Yeah. Or do you do the Star Trek that will appeal to more people who will appreciate the, the action stuff more and the high drama? I don't know. It's a, it's a hard thing. It's, it would be risky to do another like weekly starship show without the, because the long form storytelling plot arcs are what's popular in TV now, you know? Yeah. There aren't any shows other than sitcoms where you just have a one and done episode. Like everything is like, you have to watch all 17 seasons of a show to get anything from it. You can't, yeah. you can't pluck a random episode of Mad Men out and watch it or Breaking Bad or fucking Game of Thrones and watch it in the middle of season 19 and, and get, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's all like that now. And I think that's how they keep you hooked. Um, because it's a different world now with streaming television but than it was in the, in the TNG era. Next time on Star Trek The Next Generation, Counselor Troy faces a prearranged marriage. Isn't this simply beautiful? But when the groom risks his life to help a plague-infested ship... My son surrounded by those horrible lepers. You, you binge watch a, a TV series and it's like a, a, it's like a fucking five-hour long movie. That's true. Yeah. Rich, what did you think about the girl with the robot head? Oh, I thought that was a very neat visual, and I'm sad she her head blew up. <laughs> <laughs> you liked it? It was straight out of a Daft Punk video. Yeah, no, it was, that's why that was that's what was great about it. Yeah, yeah, I think that crossed the line a little. I I didn't mind uh, the return of Lobot. <laughs> oh but, yeah, uh, that guy. I mean, uh, I think, uh, maybe he's got like the Jordy LaForge ears. Yeah, yes, he yes. was born deaf. D did you like Star Trek Discovery? I, I, I would say I really liked it, um, and I, I'm, I'm excited to see more. I would like them to apply the break a little. It worked as a pilot. Like you said before, pilots are often, eh. Yeah. I mean, going back to TNG, Encounter at Farpoint. Oh, yeah. Like, Just hoping this isn't the usual way our missions will go, sir. Oh, no, number one. I'm sure most will be much more interesting. The whole first season, really, at TNG was... Yeah, yeah. Well, it took till season three for them to really get the stride. Um, I mean, there's some good episodes in... Season two. Season two like, was... halfway through season two, it weirdly kicks up. There's some, there's some good stuff in season two, but seasons three and four is, is the sweet spot of TNG. And this, this is J.J. Abrams' Star Trek, essentially, for the first episode. Visually, at least. Well, no, yeah, no, everything. I'm trying to save you. I'm trying to save all of you. JJ, the JJ films are a little bit more fun, though. They're a little bit light. Yeah, there's a humor there's, to them too, right? There's not much levity in this, except for Saru, Lieutenant Saru, the big tall guy, with okay. the alien face. Yeah, he has some humorous lines. Um, there, but yeah, you're right. It's it's very heavy. It's very very drama heavy. Um, if, if the whole show were like that, it would wear the fuck out of me. I I, I I want that scene where and and I think they teased it in the when they revealed what the discovery looks like. Yeah. You know, you want that moment where like everybody is beaming up to the ship and. Do, 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 do. Hi, I'm Lieutenant So and So. You know, we're we're gonna let's get underway, everybody. <laughs> and the camera pulls back. <laughs> Take her out, Mr. Mayweather. Straight and steady. Second start of the right, and straight on until morning, and then, you know, the ship leaves right. space dock. Da, 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 da. And then you get the beauty shots da, da, of the da, ship da. leaving, yes. Viewed as, as a movie, I don't much care for it. The whole story with the Klingons, just kind of dumb. 
Um, I, I don't like the main character, but seeing where they have went with all of this, like that, that trailer they showed at the, the end, like here's, here's what's coming next. That looks interesting. Like the thought of being on some kind of prison ship, this disgraced officer. I, I hated the pilot episodes, but I can see where they're going with it, where that could be interesting. I know why we have another Star Trek series. I'm just saying, for me, I have three seasons of TOS. I've got seven seasons of TNG. I've got seven, seven right, of, of Deep Space Nine. And then, then Voyager, and it fizzled out. And that's enough. I can, I can see where the formula might be played out. Maybe, maybe it's just, it, it just doing the same thing over again. And then I, if they made something like TNG, I'd be on here saying, what was the point? We already had it. It's just redundant. So I, I can understand the, the need to do something different. Yeah. I, just, I just don't know if the thing that's different, the, the violent high drama war is exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah. Well, if you ask me that question, what kind of yeah. Star Trek show I would make, I, I would jump well past Voyager because uh -huh. now we can do much better sets, much better special effects. I would see where the Federation is. Uh, so, let's go 15, 20 years uh, past that. Where, where is the Federation at? Um, because then you can have cameos from uh, Patrick Stewart. Oh, okay, you don't want to cut off still, the cameos. They're going to be literally their exact perfect <laughs> age. Yeah, you bring back some of those cast members, but have an all new crew, have some kind of like, um, uh, what, what is the new, the new thing? What's the new dilemma um, facing the Federation that's not war? Okay. Something okay. different. Um, some other thing that kind of threatens the stability of the Federation or the, the morals or something and some kind of ship is, is exploring it. Um, I don't know, something like that because there, there's, there are, there's a split of the fans. There's people like me and you who, who, like, who like the universe, who like the worlds, um, yeah. the ships, uh, the costumes, the, the tone, let's say. Uh, and, and there's where we like that slow moving episode where it's a show, this episode is about Data having, going on a date with a lady. It's a whole show about Data cataloging the events of his day. Um, Picard gets a little too close to the, the new uh, geologist and this romance, but he's, he's the captain and he has to order people to do dangerous things. What's the dilemma there? Oh no, she's on this planet, the planet might blow up. So it, it's, it's kind of hard to talk about the whole show off, off the uh, pilot episode. That's what yeah. we're, we're, we're attempting to do. I would say it's off to a good start. That, that montage of what's coming up in the show really interested me because we, we've seen, we've seen um, many other Star Trek series. Um, and if there is a Star Trek series that's really um, dramatically good mm. uh, and intense, and in, a, in not in a space battle way, but in character conflict way, because Gene Roddenberry's been dead for 25 <laughs> years. Okay, his notion that the characters can't have inner conflicts. Oh sure, is, sure. If Discovery really hits a home run with really well written, dramatic episodes that are that are in the Star Trek universe, but have really well-written characters and, and flawed characters, you know? That's another thing too, is like you look back at, at characters like, like Harry Kim, uh, Ensign Mayweather. Uh, Jordy LaForge, really, other than the fact that he was blind. Jordy was... LaForge didn't have much of a character. Right. Um, so you have, you have that, that, that Roddenberry influence where everyone's happy, but the really, the characters that stood out in Star Trek were the ones that were heavily conflicted or really interesting, uh, dramatically. Worf, you know, Data. Picard, Picard, Spock. Spock, definitely. Being Vulcan is more important to you than you stand there speaking rules and regulations from Starfleet and Vulcan philosophy and, and let your father die. And, and I'll hate you for the rest of my life. See, isn't, isn't this a weird thing? We have, we have watched the first two episodes of a TV show. I don't feel like I've seen a single episode yet. I feel like I have seen a preamble to something that's going to happen next. My fingers are crossed 
that they're gonna they're gonna milk something good out of all these characters, and we're gonna get some kind of really uh, dramatic quality programming. I don't care about the space battle stuff, as long as they don't overdo it. Discovery is a completely new way of telling a Star Trek story, in a way that you might not expect. You should watch carefully. <laughs> The, the Abrams villain of the week, we have a doomsday device stuff, worked in a two hour format for approximately two films. One film. One film. 1. <laughs> 1. 1.5, 1.7. Uh, and then, it, then yep. it burned itself out. And so I think they need to really be mindful of that. If this, if this, this show cannot possibly be every episode is the Klingons are coming and they're, now they have a super weapon and the super weapon is gonna destroy the entire Alpha Quadrant. We have to stop, the, it's, it's not gonna be that. I think it's gonna be more, more character driven, more political, more internal conflicts. And I'm hoping that that's the case. Okay, because I, I, was, I, was, I was like halfway through that second episode and two people were trying to violently murder each other with swords. And I was just thinking, how did Star Trek become this? Well, we can only hope. We can only hope. We'll be back next week. No, we won't. Oh, we won't? <laughs> How about this? We'll be back every now and then to talk more about Star Trek um, because there's lots of little nuggets in this, like where I'm like, hey, that's the Harry Kim maneuver. Which was the Harry Kim maneuver? Oh, um, uh, well, sort of. It, when they beamed the the warhead of the the, the the photon torpedo, oh, onto the body, onto the body. H Harry Kim uh, uh, beams. He just beams a photon torpedo inside a Borg ship. He's like, ah, and it detonated now and it blows up the whole ship. <laughs> like, why haven't you people been doing this all along? <laughs> We're gonna beam a photon torpedo into a corpse while you're collecting your dead, so we can murder you all. It's Star Trek. But yeah, and then and then she flies out in a little space suit. I don't know. That was a little that reminded me of Star Trek One. It's like psh, yeah, yeah. And then the, the the jumping through space was like Nemesis when Data's flying through things. So I'm seeing all these little 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 moments of Star Trek uh, throughout the years, uh, which we'll probably get when we watch more of the show. You exclude one group of fans by doing this. You exclude another group of fans by doing that. You're trying to bring in new fans by doing this. It's almost entirely impossible. Something as, as complex and historical mm -hmm. as Star Trek. I mean, it goes back 50 years yes. now. I mean, it's like, how do you do that? How do you do that? With a, with a new cast and a new crew, and it's been a decade since the last show, you just do it. Start fresh. You just start fresh. The future awaits. But now, with 10 years before Kirk and Spock, we can have Kirk show up if we want. 25 year old Kurt. Hmm. Why not? Hmm. Enterprise, we couldn't because it was 100 years before Kurt and Spock. <laughs> now, we got 10 years before, and we got Sarek, right? Yeah. You know that that ace is up their sleeve. I'm sure that'll that'll come back. There'll be more Sarek. The ratings are nose diving. Bring out Spock! <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sarek. This is my son. Spock! How does Spock get along with his adopted sister? Spock, meet Kirk. <laughs> <laughs>